Can you imagine that there are people who can eat a lot of stuff? Yes, there are people who can eat extraordinary amount of food. Which system is going to deal with this intake of food? The answer is, the first one is the digestive system. Then other systems will start to deal with it after absorption. Always go back to basics. Basics are very important and you can build your knowledge on a very sound, strong basics. As you see in this campus, the door that opens to science and acquiring uh, good information is questions and answers. And you can see that the needle of this campus is pointing at starting point, which is questions and look for answers. When you do that, the knowledge is not only in the answers. The knowledge is in the questions. People try to ask questions, but scientists look into the questions that other people asked and looked into their answers and then they try to uh, ask a new question. This new question requires new answer and this is what is called advanced science. What is this figure? This is the general plan of the digestive system. What is the beginning of the digestive system? It is the mouth and the mouth is in the face. You may remember that the face has four openings, two orbits, uh, a midline nasal cavity and a lower midline mouth cavity. Then, at the back of the mouth, we already know that there is a pharynx. The pharynx has three parts, the uh, upper respiratory pharynx, the oral pharynx, and lower down, the laryngopharynx. Then, the pharynx, as it gets down into the neck, it is going to lead to two ways. The anterior one is the respiratory system presented by the larynx and the posterior one is uh, represented by the passage of the food into the digestive system. So in the neck we have the end of the pharynx and the beginning of the esophagus. Then in the thorax, the esophagus has three parts. The first upper uh, part is in the neck, which is a short one, and then the longest part of the esophagus is in the thorax and as it approaches the diaphragm it has a special opening uh, for the esophagus and we have seen that when we studied the muscles of respiration. After it gets into the abdomen it has a short part and turns to the left to join the stomach. In the abdomen we have what? We have the majority of the digestive system and lower down we have the pelvis and we in the pelvis we have the last part or the end of the digestive system. 
what is this image showing me? Here is what this is the esophagus, the lower part of the thoracic esophagus, piercing the diaphragm, and it ends into opening into the stomach, and then stomach is a dilated part of the gastrointestinal tract. First of all, to store food for short time, and then for mixing it and starts dealing with it chemically by adding enzymes. Then, when the contents are ready for absorption, uh, the stomach is going to push the contents into the small intestine. To start with, we have the duodenum, then the first part of the small intestine, and then the rest part of the small intestine, and after Whatever happens in the intestine, there is uh, a left part which needs to be uh, dealt with in the last process, and this is going to happen in the large intestine, and the large intestine has a beginning, an ascending part, a transverse part, a descending part, and a curved part in the left iliac fossa and then it is going to be ready uh, to be expelled to the outside and the end point is the anal canal and this place has sphincters how many types of sphincters there are two first is involuntary and the last one is voluntary under control of the nervous system. Why presenting this slide? The reason is after the last slide we were naming the tube that starts in the mouth and ending at the anus. This is what is called gastrointestinal tract. Now, this tract needs help for digestion, and this help is, su uh, is supplied by glands. These glands are outside the gastrointestinal tract, outside the tube. They are specific structures and they have ducts. These ducts open where they open into the gastrointestinal tube and they add stuff, secretions, which are going to complete the process of digestion and uh, absorption. The largest digestive gland is the liver. We will go into some details of the liver later on. Then we have the gallbladder. The gallbladder is part of the biliary system which is going to secrete bile into the first part of the small intestine and we have pancreas. Pancreas is a mixed gland, endocrine and exocrine, and it, it gives a very supportive hand for the process of digestion. So, in conclusion, the digestive system is made of uh, a tube plus Lands. This is an overview of the digestive system. What does an overview show? It shows the main features, the main outline of the idea. 
in a summary and containing what containing key words general ideas no details this is also described as bird's eye view what does that mean it means that when a bird flies over a city it can see the whole city it can see its boundaries and it can see its main features it is not going to go into details of small streets and houses it is seeing only the main features and we start in the center that is the title of the digestive system and when you go up you see what is the basic structure of the digestive system and it bifurcates into tube and glands let's turn to the right and see what are the main features of the tube and we can see that the tube the gastrointestinal tract has four layers the mucosa the submucosa the muscularis and the serosa the mucosa is a term uh, including the epithelium then a layer of loose areolar tissue called lamina propria and then uh, a thin layer of smooth muscle called muscularis mucosa when we go back to the four layers and we go to the right to the submucosa what is the submucosa it is loose areolar tissue what does it have it has arteries veins lymphatics and nerves do we need the arteries the veins and lymphatics and nerves the answer is of course because after the process of absorption there should be structures that pick up this absorbed material and sending it to the next process going back to the four layers and we follow the red line and it leads us to the muscular layer of the gastrointestinal tract and in the upper part of this system the muscles are skeletal then as you go lower down into the esophagus there is a transition the skeletal will become smooth and what is the arrangement of the muscles of the digestive tract the arrangement is that it is inner circular around the tube and outer run longitudinal running along the long axis of the tube and of course not all parts of the gastrointestinal tract meaning the tube has almost the same arrangement there are what are called regional variations going back to the four layers and we go down and we can see the title of serosa which is the outermost layer now what is a serosa a serosa is the visceral serous membrane what is the serous membrane of uh, the abdominal cavity 
it is the peritoneum is the peritoneum has the same arrangement as the pleural cavity or the pericardial cavity the answer is yes they are all having the same arrangement uh, nothing is inside the peritoneal cavity but everything is what everything is in vaginating into this cavity so we have a visceral layer and a parietal layer now we have finished with the tube which is one of the basic structures of uh, the digestive system now we go to the left and we see the title of glands that means there are glands associated with the digestive system two lines are coming from the glands title the one to your right is the endocrine what does that mean that means there are cells in the epithelium of the tube that are going to secrete hormones they are in one cell arrangement meaning that one cell between the epithelial cells is an endocrine cells that will secrete a hormone not going into the lumen of tube but the secretion is picked up by the blood to control lots of functions of the <coughs> gastrointestinal tract when you go back to the glands we follow the green line to the exocrine part of the glands and we can see that there is pancreas pancreas is a mixed organ it is exocrine and endocrine uh, structure then we have the liver the liver is the largest gland associated with the gastrointestinal tract and it is also an exocrine and endocrine structure then we go to the exocrine the title of the glands of the gastrointestinal tract and we can see salivary glands salivary glands are opening into the mouth and there are three major pairs if we say major we mean that there is another group which is minor the three major pairs are the parotids the sides of the face submandibular in the uh, inferior floor of the mouth and sublingual uh, under the tongue now we have an idea about what we are going to see we're going to see tube and glands there's a single tube and several glands now we know the tube has four layers and the glands are in two functional categories exocrine and endocrine then we will have an overall idea about the parts of the tract we start with the oral cavity which has a tongue and teeth 
and openings of salivary glands. Next is pharynx, which has three parts, and we know these three parts by now. Then, after the pharynx comes the esophagus. What's the esophagus? The general idea is that the esophagus is a muscular tube, and there's a transition of the muscular layer from skeletal to smooth. It receives skeletal part uh, as a continuation of the pharynx, and then in the upper one third of the esophagus, the muscles are skeletal. The middle third is a combination of skeletal and smooth muscles, and in the lower part of the esophagus, all the muscles of the tube are smooth muscles. Then the esophagus is going to open into the stomach and the first thing that strikes attention in the stomach is that this dilated part and it does not have two layers of muscles it has a third layer on the inside and in the stomach we start to have many glands. These glands are tubular and they are going to secrete acid and enzymes. Next to the stomach will be the small intestine. The small intestine has three major parts. What is called the duodenum attached to the stomach, then jejunum and ileum. The question here, what is status of the mucosa? The mucosa is not going to be smooth because this is the place of absorption and we need maximum surface of absorption and therefore the epithelial lining the mucosa is going to have, first of all, the lie to increase the surface of absorption. Each cell is going to have microvilli, and plus there is an extra fold of the mucosa, which are, we are going to see in next few slides. Next to the small intestine is the large intestine. The large intestine has eight parts and it has special mucosa, it has special glands, and it has special arrangement of the muscular layer. And the last part is the anal canal. This anal canal has several structures, but what strikes uh, the observer is that there are sphincters. Not one sphincter, but there are sphincters. One category is involuntary and the lowest and the next is voluntary group of sphincters. Let's ask ourselves a few questions about this diagram of what it is of the tube making gastrointestinal tract. First of all, we have the lumen. Then Next to the lumen, of course, it is going to be the mucosa. The mucosa, as we have learned, it 
is made of an epithelium. This epithelium is made of what? First of all, it is made of absorptive cells. Which epithelium is capable of absorbing? It is the columnar epithelium. Simple columnar epithelium. Then, underneath it, of course, there is a basement membrane and there is a layer of loose areolar tissue called lamina propria. And then we have a thin layer of smooth muscle which is called muscularis mucosa. Muscularis is made of smooth muscles and mucosa it acts on the epithelium which is folded. When it contracts, it increases the folds, and when it relaxes, it lowers the folds. So this is the mucosa. Next is the submucosa. Submucosa is thicker than the lamina propria, and in the submucosa, we are going to have the neurovascular structures, the arteries, the veins, the lymphatics, and the nerves. The outer part of some mucosa, we have the muscular layers. How many layers? There are two. What is the inner layer? It is circular, smooth muscles. What is the outer layer? Is the longitudinal layer. And the outermost layer of the tube is visceral peritoneum. What is the name of this? visceral peritoneum in case of uh, the digestive system it is called cirrhosa let's ask a few questions about this image what is it? it is an image of a tube and what is it showing? it is showing the different layers of the tube. First, the mucosa. The mucosa is the first tissue to meet the lumen. And what are the components of the mucosa? They are the epithelium. Which type of epithelium? Absorptive type of epithelium, which is simple columnar. And then we have loose, thin layer of uh, areolar tissue called the lamina propria and then we have a thin layer of muscle called muscularis mucosa. This muscularis mucosa is thin and it acts only on the mucosa and it is not part of the muscular layer of the tube. And then we have the submucosa. If you look at the submucosa, you can see that it has veins, arteries, and nerves. Is the blood supply of the gastrointestinal tract good? The answer is it is very good blood supply. Not only that, but it has very good lymphatic system because the lymphatic system is going to absorb the large molecules, especially the 
fat. Then we go to the muscular layer, which is made of inner circular and outer longitudinal. And the outermost layer is the visceral peritoneum. What is the visceral peritoneum made of? It is a serous membrane. And any serous membrane is made of an epithelium, which is of which type? Simple squamous. And de developmentally, it is called mesothelium. And a little bit of loose alveolar tissue underneath this uh, epithelium. Then the nerves, the nerves supplying the tube is in form of what? It is in form of two plexuses, one between the muscles and one in the submucosa. Can we see glandular system in this tube? The answer is yes. Between the epithelial cells there are single cell endocrine glands plus openings of ducts of the major glands of the gastrointestinal system. This is a duct of whether it is a liver or pancreas or salivary gland. And this is the neurovascular bundle reaching the, the tube through two folds of peritoneum called a mesentery. What is a mesentery? A mesentery is two folds of the peritoneal serous membrane. What is this image going to add to my information? Let us see. The arrow is pointing at circular folds of the mucosa. When we say circular folds, that means there are elevations and depressions between elevations. And if we look into this histological section, we can see that there are two circles. Inside each circle, there is an elevation of the mucosa into the lumen. What is this elevation containing? It is containing the epithelium, the lamina propria, and submucosa. The epithelium and this the structure is going to send fingers. These fingers are called villi. Now, this is to increase the absorptive surface. When we come to the epithelial cells lining these villi, these epithelial cells have microvilli also serve to increase the absorptive surface and these elevations are called plica circularis. Let us ask ourselves a few questions about this drawing and it demonstrates layers of the tube of the gastrointestinal tract. 
this is the inside it's the lumen then it is the mucosa with its three components don't miss that the mucosa is only the epithelium the epithelium is one part of three components of the mucosa then we have submucosa which contains lots of uh, blood vessels, lymphatics and nerves then it is going to be smooth muscle layers surrounding the tube and it is in two layers in a circular and outer longitudinal and lastly it is the serosa serosa is what it is the visceral peritoneum what is the peritoneum is a serous membrane time to write notes writing notes will confirm our information and tells us how much we know and how much we are missing if we follow center of this mind map and we go through the green idea the green idea it says it's the mucosa and what is the mucosa the mucosa is the innermost layer then the green line is going to divide into three ideas the epithelium lamina propria and muscularis mucosa what about the epithelium the epithelium is made of uh, for example in the mouth it is made of non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and this type of epithelium is present in the mouth pharynx esophagus and lower down in the anal canal and the majority of the gastrointestinal tract the epithelium is simple columnar it is the absorptive type of epithelium and then we have few endocrine cells we know that glands develop from epithelial tissue and these endocrine cells secrete hormones after the epithelium and deep to it is the lamina propria what is it made of it's made of areolar connective tissue and has blood vessels lymphatics and nerves deep to the lamina propria we have muscularis mucosa this is a thin smooth muscle layer and it when it contracts it makes simple folds of the mucosa then we go to the left and follow the pink uh, idea which is saying that it is the submucosa what about the submucosa it is thin areolar connective tissue what does it have it has many blood vessels arteries veins and nerves now the nerve plexuses are sensory 
motor autonomic increase or decrease contractions and all these components are called the enteric nervous system the nervous system of the digestive tract go to the center and follow the line going down to the right and it is going to describe the muscularis layer if you go to the yellow marked idea it says skeletal muscles they are present in the mouth pharynx and upper one third of the esophagus and of course lower down uh, represented by the sphincters of the anal canal in the middle third of the esophagus <coughs> there are combination of smooth and skeletal muscles while lower down of the esophagus and down to the anal canal it is smooth muscle what is the arrangement of muscular layer it is made of inner circular outer longitudinal is that always the situation the answer is no in the stomach we have a third layer is it only in, in the stomach the answer is yes it is only in the stomach that there is a third layer and it is the innermost layer and uh, it helps in mixing food when we go to the center and then study the uh, blue idea about the serosa we know lots of these informations about the serous cavities the serous membrane and what is visceral and what is uh, parietal but there is a special arrangement in the serous membrane of the abdominal organs and this arrangement is what is called the mesentery when a part of the tube invaginates the, the parietal peritoneum and it gets inside deep inside the abdominal cavity but not inside the peritoneal cavity it takes with it two layers of peritoneum and this two layer structure is called a mesentery what is this this is the beginning of the gastrointestinal tube it is the mouth and this arrow is pointing at the space between the lips and the teeth and this space is called the vestibule of the mouth now this vestibule is outside the arch of the teeth and most posteriorly the vestibule is connected to the proper mouth cavity what is the proper mouth cavity it is inside the arch of the teeth so the vestibule is connected to the proper mouth cavity posteriorly and this is the proper mouth cavity inside 
the arches of the teeth. What are the parts we see in this opened mouth? We can see the vestibule of the mouth cavity and then inside the arches of the teeth is the proper mouth cavity and the floor of the oral cavity is the tongue and the roof is paid by two parts the heart palate and we have seen the heart palate made of the palatine processes of the maxilla and the palatine bone posterior to it and then we have the soft palate soft palate is made of muscles and it has different parts and it acts as a valve separating the nasopharynx from the oropharynx in the middle of the soft palate we have a protrusion called uvula and the mouth cavity is going to lead to the oropharynx and this door or this gate between the mouth and the oropharynx is called the fauces. What is this? This is an opened real life uh, mouth of a person. The floor is made by the tongue. The lateral part is made by uh, what is called the cheeks. The cheek is the lateral part of the mouth and on the outside uh, of course there is skin and there is a muscle called the boxinator and on the inside it is lined by uh, the proper kind of epithelium which is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and the roof we know what the roof is made of and then the soft palate and the mouth opens into the oropharynx through an opening called the fauces. This slide is presented to you to review your knowledge of the roof of the mouth. What is this? This is a sagittal diagram of the face where it shows the soft palate. The soft palate is a muscular structure and acts as a valve. When it goes up, it separates the nasopharynx from the oropharynx so that you can swallow the food and it comes down when you are not swallowing and it opens the upper air passages so if you eat and talk then the soft palate doesn't know what to do therefore food is going to get into the upper respiratory tract because there is mixing of air and food in the oral pharynx. This is an open mouth and it is useful to review what we have seen. We can see the tongue the floor of the mouth. The heart palate is the roof of the mouth. 
soft palate is a valve at the posterior end of the mouth. Then we have uvula, a projection from the soft palate, and we have the tonsils. Tonsils here are enlarged and they are lymphoid tissue and they are there to guard the passage of the fauces and you can see there is an arch in the front of tonsils. This is called the anterior arch of the soft palate. It is a mind map of summary of uh, the oral cavity. Now you know where is the location, and then you go down to the cavity. And if you go to the left, the green idea it is talking about the vestibule. And then if you go to the right, it is the mouth proper cavity there is a roof and lateral part and the floor and the mucosa now the openings of the proper mouth cavity it has openings of salivary glands especially submandibular gland ducts open to the proper mouth cavity plus sublingual uh, salivary gland. By now we have collected good information about the mouth and we go the next stage of the pharynx. Now you know the pharynx and you know its parts when we talked about the respiratory system and the uppermost part is the nasopharynx receiving air from the nasal cavity and then the oropharynx posterior to the mouth and the laryngopharynx going down posterior to the opening of the larynx leading to the esophagus. So this is the posterior nares or the posterior opening of the nose and this is the fauces leading to the oropharynx and here is the Larynx with the epiglottis raised up and the larynx is opened. Now the pharynx is going to lead to the esophagus and we can see these three arrows pointing at the esophagus. The esophagus has a little small part in the neck and then uh, it has a thoracic part in the posterior with the stinum. As it comes down it reaches the diaphragm and it has a special opening in the diaphragm. Uh, do you remember what is this opening made of? Uh, if you don't I will remind you it is when the uh, right crust of the diaphragm goes up and turns towards the left, it surrounds the opening of the esophagus. And as it comes into the abdominal cavity, it is short and it enters the stomach. Let us see what happens in the esophagus when it is in the thoracic cavity. 
what happens and where is the esophagus in the thoracic cavity here is the beginning of the esophagus that is the lower end of the pharynx and this area is constricted and this the esophagus has three uh, normal constrictions this is the highest and number one and where is the esophagus it is in the posterior mediastinum and uh, we had an idea about what is the mediastinum in the upper mediastinum in the superior part it is posterior to the trachea then as it comes down it becomes uh, to the right of the descending thoracic aorta and it pierces the diaphragm and the abdominal part is short and it joins the stomach question what is this area it is the point of the esophagus piercing the diaphragm and getting into the stomach so that's the, di the esophagus and the esophagus is a tube and the folds of the mucosa as you can see are longitudinal because it allows the expansion of the esophagus when we swallow a bolus of food and as we come lower down in the esophagus there is a wavy line this wavy line represents what? it represents a sudden change sudden change of what? sudden change of type of mucosa what was in the esophagus? it was stratified non-keratinized squamous epithelia what is the mucosa of stomach it is simple columnar so there is a sudden change of uh, the epithelium and then it is in the mind of some people that there is a valve between the esophagus and the stomach anatomically there is no thickening of the inner circular muscles of the esophagus all these questions are important to ask because food must travel in normal physiological direction that is esophagus to stomach sometimes certain people have uh, unphysiological return of gastric contents into the esophagus and this is uh, uh, important pathology because the acidity of the stomach will burn the uh, mucosa of the esophagus The esophagus is a hard organ to examine because it's in the posterior mediastinum. It is very deep. Plus, we have the thoracic cage anteriorly and the vertebral column posteriorly. Therefore, uh, <coughs> as well as the stomach, it is difficult to see what's inside the stomach. Uh, therefore an endoscope was made which is a thin tube that comes down attached to a camera and one can see what is the inside of the esophagus and what is inside the stomach uh, the image to your right is an image of an endoscope coming down the esophagus and you can see the little hole 
in the middle of the image. This represents the junction between the esophagus and the stomach. So it represents the area in the inside of this yellow oval shape. These are important questions to ask when people come to you and say, I have acidity coming up to my mouth and I have a pain behind the sternum. This is a bird's eye view of the esophagus. In an overview, it is collapsible tube. That means in normal physiological conditions, when you are not swallowing, the, uh, the esophagus is collapsed. The lumen is closed. And then there is the question of how long is the esophagus. The esophagus is 25 centimeters long. Now, where is the esophagus? The first upper part is in the neck, the level of C6, and it is inferior to the pharynx, and this is the first point of constriction. In the thorax, the esophagus is in the posterior mediastinum, and it is, of course, posterior to the heart, because the heart is in the middle uh, uh, mediastinum and the esophagus is anterior to the vertebral column and as it passes through the diaphragm there is uh, in the diaphragm an esophageal opening made by a loop of the right crust of the diaphragm and it is at the level of T10 in the abdomen it is short around 2 cm and joins the stomach. Now what is the structure of the esophagus? We go through the four layers. The mucosa is stratified non-keratinized squamous epithelium. Why? Because uh, it should tolerate friction. Then the lamina propria and muscularis mucosa. And the submucosa which is made of connective tissue, there is something which is appearing for the first time, and that is glands. They are called esophageal glands, and they are mucus glands, and they send ducts to open into the lumen of the esophagus. Then, Another very special feature of the esophagus, and that is the muscular layer. It is following the general arrangement of inner circular and outer longitudinal, but there are two types of muscles in the muscular layer of the esophagus, the upper third it is skeletal, the middle third it is mixed, smooth and skeletal, and in the lower third it is only uh, smooth. Now, what is the blood supply? The, the, the blood supply is described as segmental, that means it is uh, multiple and coming usually from uh, the descending thoracic aorta. And the venous blood, where does it go? In the lower part, it goes to the portal system. And the portal system drains uh, the venous blood of all abdominal gastrointestinal tract. What do I learn from this image? 
I know that the esophagus is going to go through the diaphragm to join the stomach. And this image is also showing me that the mucosa of the stomach is not smooth. It is filled with folds. These folds are called rugi. What do I learn from this image? This image is showing me that there are different parts of the stomach and they have different names. Now, the point where the esophagus comes and joins the stomach is called car. Yeah. Then we have the uppermost dome shaped part of the stomach, which is called the fundus. Then the major central part is the body. As the stomach comes down and going towards the right, there is the Entral area or the entrum preparing itself to send food to the duodenum, and this is the pyloric area. And the curve on the inside is called the lesser curvature because it is short and on the left, it is longer and it is to the left and it starts at the cardia, travels uh, on the outer surface of the fundus, the body and the pyloric antrum. So the greater curvature is really much greater than the lesser curvature. What is this image of the stomach showing me? It is showing me that the stomach has a dilated part of the gastrointestinal tract. And you can see that in the upper end the esophagus is a tube. And on the left the duodenum is a tube. But the stomach is dilated for physiological reasons. And on the anterior surface, we can see that this is the outer longitudinal uh, layer of the muscularis, and then it is the inner circular layer of the muscular layer, and here is the new thing. It is an innermost layer. Deeper to the two layers, and this layer is neither longitudinal nor circular. It is an oblique arrangement of smooth muscle cells. What is the relation of the stomach to the liver? It is inferior to the left lobe of the liver. What is the relation of the stomach to the spleen? The spleen is to the far left of the stomach. What is the relation of transverse colon, part of the large intestine, to the stomach? It is inferior to the stomach. What are the relevant questions that, that one can ask about the formation of this image? There are so many information. First of all, the liver is under the diaphragm. This is the right lobe of the liver. And the left lobe of the liver crossing the midline and it is covering the lower part of the esophagus, the abdominal part, and the fundus of the stomach. 
what does that mean? That means that when we look at the posterior surface of the liver, we see an impression of the esophagus and we see an impression of the fundus of the stomach. Questions. Do you know that the stomach secretes enzymes and hydrochloric acid? The answer is most probably yes. These secretions, they come from what? They come, of course, from glands. Glands develop from where? From epithelium. And we know different types of glands. There are tubular and branched and alveolar and mixed and so on. Now, if you look at the tip of this arrow, there is an opening of the gland to the cavity of the stomach. And this is called a pit. Then, the tubular glands coming from the surface epithelium, they go down for some distance. This process of going down makes the mucosa of the stomach the thickest part in the gastrointestinal tract. There are several questions about the gastric glands. Where do they open? They open into the surface of the stomach. And what do they secrete? They secrete hydrochloric acid and enzymes. And they also need to secrete mucus. Why they secrete mucus? Because they want uh, to protect the lining of the stomach from the effect of enzymes and hydrochloric acid. And the very upper end of the gland is called the pit. And then we have the gland itself, which is made of isthmus, neck, and the base of the gland. The question is uh, if this gland is going to secrete mucus, it's going to secrete hydrochloric acid, and it secretes enzymes, and it secretes hormones as well. So, are we going to have one type of cells in, in these glands or several types? Of course, the answer is going to be several types of cells. Here is an area of very important questions, where we can see the green cells forming the pit and the neck of the gastric glands, and these are uh, mucus secreting glands. Then, immediately in the isthmus, just below these cells, there are cells that are called progenitor cells. Progenitor means they can develop into uh, another line of cells, and of course, we have different types of cells in the gastric glands, and they need replacement when they are damaged and these are the progenitor cells that will replace cells upwards and downwards. Here is uh, the abdominal cavity where the abdominal wall is removed. And what is this relation? It is telling that the fundus of the stomach is the dome, upper part, 
is under the left uh, part of the diaphragm and that the diaphragm is covering the fundus of the stomach all around. What is this arrow telling? It is telling that the lesser curvature is connected to two layers of peritoneum going towards the liver. This is called lesser omentum. And along the greater curvature of the stomach, especially the central part, it is also connected to two layers of uh, peritoneum. With, but these two layers, as they come down, they go up again and they form four layers of peritoneum. This is called uh, the greater momentum of the stomach. This is a diagram of the stomach and it is a good exercise for you to ask yourself questions and trying to answer them. What do I learn from this interior view of the stomach? And the first thing that strikes the eyes of the observer is that there are longitudinal folds of the stomach called rugi. And they are in the form of wrinkles or creases. Why is that? Because it allows distension. It is not a smooth mucosa. What is this? Here is a diagram of the wall of the stomach where you can see the mucosa which is made of an epithelium, lamina propria and muscularis mucosa. The glands of the stomach make the mucosa of the stomach the thickest part of the gastrointestinal tract. Then we have this layer which is full of arteries, veins, lymphatics and nerves. This is the submucosa and then we have uh, the innermost layer of the three layers of the stomach, which is the internal innermost oblique, then the inner circular and outer longitudinal, and the last outermost layer is the serosa, the epithelium plus subserosal connective tissue. It is always important to write notes. We know the shape of the stomach which is a J shape and the stomach is going to change its shape when uh, it gets full, it goes down to the pelvis. It can take uh, lots of stuff. And where is the stomach? We already know that. What are the parts of the stomach? The cardia is where the esophagus joins the stomach, the fundus, the body, the curves, and the pyloric. And we come to the wall of the stomach. We know that uh, the mucosa is folded into rugi and the epithelium is simple columnar and there are pits leading to glands and the glands have different types of cells secreting different 
enzymes, hydrochloric acid, and hormones as well. And submucosa, the muscularis is special because it has three layers, and the serosa is covering the anterior and posterior surfaces of the stomach, but along the curvatures, it sends folds to the liver as lesser omentum and sends a fold down which comes back therefore uh, it becomes four layers and this is called the greater omentum uh, the stomach has multiple blood supply therefore the stomach never farts and the veins drain into the portal system so anything absorbed in the stomach and there is absorption of some uh, stuff uh, you may know that some drugs are absorbed from the stomach they don't go to the blood circulation immediately they go to the liver through the portal system to be checked or changed or detoxified and then they enter the circulation and the stomach is having a nerve supply most important is the vagus the vagus is going to stimulate production of hydrochloric acid what is next to the stomach it is the duodenum This is the first part of the duodenum receiving stomach contents from the pyloric sphincter. Pyloric sphincter is a thick inner, mus inner muscular circular muscle that acts as a valve closed so that the stomach can mix the food and digest it and then it opens it opens into the first part of the duodenum which is called the ampulla also it makes the first inch of the duodenum the duodenum has two parts bulb or the ampulla and then second inch of the first part of the duodenum. What is the direction of the first part? It is horizontal. Then we have the second part, which is vertical, and it is called the descending part. And the third part is the inferior one. It is also horizontal. And then crosses the midline and ascends up to join the next part of the small intestine which is the duodenum and this is the fourth part of the duodenum and it opens into the duodenum where is the duodenum the duodenum is on the posterior abdominal wall it is stuck to the posterior abdominal wall why? because it lies deep to the parietal peritoneum that means it is extra peritoneal and peritoneum fixes the duodenum to the posterior abdominal wall Once the duodenum starts, the duodenum is an absorptive organ and therefore we need structures that will increase the absorptive surface and these are villi as you can see on your right. There are long projections, these are villi and of course they are lined with absorptive epithelium 
simple columnar ones with microvilli to further increase the absorptive surface and at the bottom of the villi there are glands because the duodenum also secretes enzymes and few hormones then we have a problem the problem is the acidity of the stomach the stomach contains hydrochloric acid which is mixed with food digested food and it is acidic and it immediately enters the duodenum bringing its acidity therefore this acidity should be neutralized how is the duodenum going to neutralize this acidity by adding mucus and bicarbonate where are these two elements produced they are produced by glands where are these glands they are in the submucosa of the duodenum and what are they called they are called Brunner's glands as you can see between the interrupted green lines uh, that this area of submucosa has lots of circles these circles are a scenario of mucus secreting cells this is the submucosa full of uh, mucus secreting glands <coughs> more questions about the duodenum and answers are in this image here is the pyloric antrum of the stomach and this is the pyloric sphincter hypertrophied inner circular muscle of the stomach and you can see the curve of the duodenum this structure the green structure uh, is the common bile duct coming from the liver comes posterior to the first part of the duodenum and on the inner side of the second part and it is going to be joined by the pancreatic duct and these two open into a special opening on the medial wall of the second part of the duodenum called the greater duodenal papilla and this is the body of the pancreas getting to the inside C-shaped duodenum and here is part of pancreas superior to the <coughs> third part of the duodenum which is called the head of the pancreas where's the head of, of the pancreas it's inside the c-shaped uh, duodenum and the duodenum as it goes up joins the jejunum the very absorptive upper part of the small intestine and if you look at the body and the head of the pancreas there's a, a construction called neck of the pancreas and deep to it is spear mesenteric artery and vein where is the beginning of the jejunum it is inferior to the body of 
pancreas. What is posterior to the neck of the pancreas? It's the spermous enteric artery and vein. We have several questions and this image is going to answer many of them. What is this structure? This is the first part of the duodenum. That's the second part. What is this? This is the third part, transverse part of the duodenum. This is the ascending or the fourth part of the duodenum. And here is the beginning of the jejunum. Now, this is the body of pancreas becoming the head as it enters the curve, the inner curve of the duodenum, and this is the body of the pancreas going obliquely towards the left, and the end at the left part of the pancreas is called the tail of the pancreas. And this tail of the pancreas is reaching the hilum of the spleen. Two images showing the inside of the jejunum and the ileum. And we have several questions about that. What about the plica circularis, the circular folds for the sake of increasing surface of absorption? It is very prominent in the jejunum and less prominent in the ileum. Why is that? Because most of what should be absorbed have been absorbed by the Jejunum. Question. Where do we find the jejunum? We find it in the upper left part of the abdominal cavity. And where do we find the ileum, the third part of the small intestine? We find it in the right iliac fossa, lower right part of the abdominal cavity. And if you look and uh, very closely, you find the jejunum is uh, wider than the duodenum and the ileum. We have a problem. <coughs> we need to increase the absorptive surface so that we can absorb as much as we can of the digested food. So, what do we do? We increase the surface area of absorption by pushing the submucosa into the lumen. When we do that, we are pushing villi, microvilli into the lumen and we have more villi and more absorptive surface. This is called the plica circularis. Now, the villi are finger-like projections that have a core of connective tissue containing blood vessels and lymphatics and we will see in the next slide what kind of information is going to tell us.
this is a lower power of the <coughs> small intestine where we can see what the most prominent feature is here is the projection of plica circularis into the lumen center of plica circularis is made of what it is made of submucosa what is the surface of plica circularis made of it is made of villi what are the cells of villi they are absorptive epithelial cells uh, what type of cells simple columnar what do they have on their luminous surface they have microvilli why do we have microvilli to further increase the absorptive surface now we have several questions we need to increase the absorptive surface by villi but function of the duodenum and jejunum uh, is not only absorption it is also secretion of digestive enzymes and other materials can villi secrete these substances the answer is no what do we need? We need glands that will secrete these uh, materials. Where are these glands? They are at the bottom of the villi and they are in the form of depressions, simple tubular. So, where are these glands? They are between villi at the bottom the mucosa and the villi are the bounded structures with the green interrupted line and the blue interrupted line is marking the glands so we have the sequence of uh, glands villi glands, villi, glands. Here is a diagram, a drawing that will clarify the idea. And we have several questions. This is the starting point of the epithelium. When the lines of projection, this projection is called villus and the plural is villi and the epithelium is an absorptive type of epithelium then as it comes down from a villus it dips down into the lamina propria and this is a simple tubular gland this is a simple tubular gland that is called Crypt of Liver Coon. Let us try and describe answers for several questions. What are these projections? They are plica circularis what is the center of plica circularis it is the submucosa and what are the arms coming from the, the plica circularis they are the villi what is the center of a villus that is loose connected tissue containing arteries, veins and lymphatics and nerves. Writing notes and most importantly arrange them in proper 
place. Do we know where is the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine? We know that. Do we know the parts of the duodenum, first, second, third, and fourth? We know that. Which part joins the duodenum? It's the fourth part. What do you call the descending part? It is second and so on. What are the modifications that are specific for the duodenum? The first time uh, that the small intestine has plica circularis is present in the duodenum. What are specific features of the wall of the duodenum that is the presence of Rune's gland why do we have this we have this group of glands to neutralize acidity uh, does the duodenum have uh, protective mechanisms the answer is yes it has uh, group of lymphocytes arranged as lymphatic tissue that is going to produce antibodies when exposed to an antigen. If we go into the problem of the duodenum, we know where is the duodenum. Where is it? It is upper left part of the abdominal cavity. What are the specific things in the structure of the duodenum that makes it different? The answer is higher plica circularis, longer villi, more microvilli, deeper crypts, glands and it also has a lymphoid tissue. If we go to the ileum, the ileum has lower plica circularis but also shorter villi because there is less absorption in the ileum but we have many lymphoid tissue in the ileum and the blood supply is something we know the small intestine is going to be supplied by the celiac trunk and superior mesenteric artery why not inferior as well because the inferior mesenteric artery is going to supply the left part of the large intestine. I'm going to leave this slide for you to follow up the parts of the large intestine. Follow the colors and the names. Hopefully this image is going to answer many of our questions. What is the part of the small intestine joining the large intestine? It is the last part of the ileum called terminal ileum. What is the beginning of the large intestine? It is a blind end dilated structure. What is it called? It's called the cecum. Does the cecum have any little extension? The answer is yes. What is called? It is called the appendix. The vermiform appendix. The vermiform means like a worm. Is there any specific 
features of the large intestine? The answer is it is going across the abdominal cavity. What is the structure pointed at the last arrow? It is called the ascending column. From where does it begin? It begins from the cecum and goes up and turns. What structure makes it turns to the midline? It is the liver. And does it make an impression on the liver? The answer is yes. Next is transverse column running across the upper part of the abdominal cavity. Is there a specific feature about the transverse column? The answer is yes. It is attached to the greater omentum, the folds of peritoneum coming from where the greater omentum comes from the greater curvature of the stomach. And as it is going towards the left, it goes a little bit higher because there is nothing preventing it uh, from going higher. And this is going to reach spleen and therefore it is called the splenic flexure. So when the large intestine changes direction on the right the liver changes its direction and on the left uh, it is up and higher than the right flexure mm -hmm. on the left side there is the descending colon or large intestine and then there is an S shaped part in the left iliac fossa called sigmoid colon which goes towards the midline and forms the rectum. What do I see on the anterior surface of the large intestine? I can see that it is not smooth, it is saculated, it has segments. And then there is a line of structure running along the anterior surface. Why is that? Because of the arrangement of inner circular and outer longitudinal. What is this special arrangement? The answer is that the outer longitudinal is not uh, around 100, 360 around large intestine. It collects into three bands. These three bands are called tinea coli. The rectum, as it comes down, it loses its visceral peritoneum and goes, goes down to join the anal canal. This image is going to answer our first question. When the terminal ilium joins the large intestine, should there be anything preventing contents of the large intestine to go back into the duodenum? The answer is yes. What do we call a structure that prevents backward movement? We call it a valve. And what is this valve called? It is called the ileocecal valve. And what is it made of? It is made of the mucosa of the large intestine. Now, the lowest part of the large intestine or the 
very beginning is the cecum, and the cecum has an opening that leads into the vermiform appendix. Then we have uh, this structure, which is called saccuration or uh, haustra, and the process is called haustration. Why is that? Because the outer longitudinal is in three bands, and this collection is going to leave the inner circular free of the outer longitudinal, and it arranges itself into these successive sacs, which are called saccurations or haustrations. How many tinea coli do we have? We have three. This is a circulation or hostration, and this is the tinea coli, one of the bands of the three. Where are we now? We are in the pelvis, the true pelvic cavity. What is the structure? This is the tinea coli of the last part of the sigmoid colon. And this is the rectum connecting the sigmoid colon to the anal canal. Is there any tinea coli in the rectum? The answer is no. Now, why is that? Because the outer longitudinal muscle that makes the tinea coli when it collects into three bands, this outer longitudinal layer is going to become normal, redistributed 360s around the rectum. Therefore, the rectum has no tinea coli. And the rectum goes down and joins the anal canal. Biting notes is an important process of learning because if you can write it, you know it. If you cannot write it, or you get stuck, you don't know it, or your information is uh, lacking some vital parts. Here's a mind map of the large intestine, and you can go through it very easily. Let's go to the center, and then go and to the left, to the area marked as modification. What are the modifications that are present uh, and specific for the large intestine? We start with the tinea coli. They are the outer longitudinal muscles in three bands. Then, there is no absorption in the large intestine except for water and therefore we do not need villi. Do we have microvilli? The answer is fewer. Do we have crypts, glands going into the lamina propria? The answer is yes and plenty of them. What are these glands made of? They are made of goblet cells. You know what is goblet cell in the respiratory system. It's a mucus secreting single cell. So the large intestine needs mucus so that the contents can pass easily. Uh, and we, in addition to the tinea coli, the presence of tinea coli is going to lead to what? It is going to lead to the 
formation of circulation or the haustration. What is this? This is the rectum joining the anal canal. What is so specific as the rectum comes in the, the pelvis to join the anal canal, it has folds of mucosa called anal valves. Therefore, uh, whatever the contents are, they start moving in an oblique directions and these are leading to the outside and why do we have these <coughs> transverse folds? These transverse folds are going to separate air from feces. Looking at what? Looking at the very uh, junction between the lower end of the rectum and anal canal. And this is the anal rectal junction. And what are these? The rectum has longitudinal folds. And these folds, as they come and join the anal canal, they form columns of mucous membrane. They are called uh, anal columns. Now, is there any structure between a column and the next? The answer is yes. There is a very small uh, space called anal uh, sinuses or anal spaces and these are uh, bit lying between anal columns. This is the anal rectal junction and the anal canal a little bit further away from the last slide. Hopefully it will help us see certain structures. This is the rectum, lowest part, and here are the <coughs> spaces leading to the pouches, and between a pouch and a pouch there is a fold called anal fold, or it is called column of morgagni. Now, the rectum has uh, an origin and the anal canal has another origin. It comes from skin. Therefore, the skin has, in the gluteal area, as it reaches the lower end of the anal canal, it is going to go inside to meet the mucosa of the rectum. So when skin meets the mucosa of the lower end of the rectum, it makes a wavy line called dentate line or pectinate line. This is the junction between the anal canal and the lower end of the rectum. And of course the anal canal is lined with skin, not a mucous membrane. <coughs> this is a mind map of the anal canal showing the different features of the anal canal. In addition to the glands that are present within the epithelium of the gastrointestinal tract in different places, we have 
another set of glands they are outside the tube they are specific structures and they have their own capsule and their own duct that uh, opens into the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract the first and the largest is the parotid gland then we have the submandibular gland and sublingual gland uh, these glands they are opening into the mouth and they are present in the face and in the neck this is a lateral view of the face and we will be addressing a few notes about the parotid gland we have two parotid glands one on each side so they are paired and uh, we can see here is the parotid gland surrounded by the yellow lines and if we look at its size it is the largest uh, gland opening into the mouth and where is the parotid gland if we want to describe its location then it is anterior to the ear pre-auricular and this gland has its own capsule and its own duct this duct running on the masseter muscle and goes deep to pierce the buccinator and opens into the vestibule of the mouth uh, opposite upper second molar and this duct is called parotid duct or stenson duct the other smaller uh, salivary gland appears in this view is the submandibular and submandibular is uh, in the digastric triangle of the neck and it is below the margin of the mandible therefore it is present in the neck this is a lateral view of the face and what do we see we can see the external ear and anterior and inferior to it is the parotid gland and the parotid gland is pierced by meaning that within the substance of the parotid gland there is facial nerve the cranial nerve number seven that will go through the parotid gland and then divides into its several branches to supply muscles of facial expression and this facial nerve divides the parotid gland into a larger superficial part and a smaller deep part this deep part has little extensions deep in the face uh, one of them is around the temporomandibular joint and uh, this is why uh, patients who have problems they say we have pain when we open the mouth hopefully that this image is going to answer uh, our questions the submandibular salivary gland is second largest which one is the largest of course is the parotid gland where is the 
submandibular cerebellar gland is in the submandibular triangle. Uh, specifically, submandibular triangle has several smaller triangles inside it, and the specifically, submandibular gland is in the digastric triangle. And does it have any divisions? The, the answer is yes, it has two lobes. First of all, the lobe under the skin is the superficial lobe, which is the largest one. And uh, secondly, the deep lobe. These two lobes are continuous with each other, and uh, a muscle called the mylohyoid muscle uh, separates them, but they are continuous with each other posteriorly. Where is the deep part of the submandibular gland? Uh, it is inside the mouth while superficial lobe is outside the mouth and it is going to send a duct from which lobe from the deep lobe where is the submandibular duct it is in the floor of the mouth what is it called it is called the Wharton duct where does it open? It opens on both sides of the frenulum of the tongue. In this image, uh, we are going to have a look at the sublingual salivary gland. Where is sublingual salivary gland? It is under the tongue as its name. Uh, indicates and uh, it is in the floor of the mouth. Uh, is it the smallest? Yes, it is the smallest salivary gland. Does it have a duct? The answer is it has 11 ducts. Uh, they open directly into the floor of the mouth. In this view, the mandible has been cut, and here, what can we see? This is the superficial lobe of the submandibular salivary gland, and here is the edge of the muscle that you can see, which is called the mylohyoid, It makes the floor of the mouth. And this is the deep part of the submandibular salivary gland. And here is the duct running in the floor of the mouth and opens at the base of the frenulum of the tongue. If you look at the center of this mind map, which is a way of writing down our notes on what we have studied and it is very important to write notes uh, if we look to the right the branch says major salivary glands and if you look to the left it says minor salivary glands what are minor salivary glands they are present all over the mouth and they have no capsule or major ducts uh, and they can be found in the lips uh, and around the mouth and they have minor contribution to secretion of the saliva. When we go to the major salivary glands uh, they are present outside the oral mucosa and they have uh, specific capsule and specific ducts. Two parotid glands, uh, we know the location now, and uh, 
The parotid glands are serous glands. They have serous SNI and secrete enzymes uh, in addition to water. And uh, one of these enzymes is the amylase. Then the parotid duct or the stensin's duct it is having a course that we have just seen. It opens opposite the upper second molar and it has double nerve supply autonomic uh, increased sympathetic activity will produce thick saliva and increased parasympathetic activity secretes uh, thinner uh, saliva when we go and write notes about the submandibular salivary glands we know the location now, it has two parts, one under the tongue, the deep one, and one in the submandibular region, the superficial one. What does it secrete? It secretes mucus and serous secretion, so it is a mixed gland, uh, and the duct is called the Wharton's duct in the floor of the mouth and opens at the base of the frenulum. The sublingual glands are under the tongue and they have several own ducts not a single one. This is a front diagram of the abdomen where we can see the liver, the dark brown structure extending from the right hypochondrium to the epigastric and then to the left hypochondrium and we can see also has two lobes, right and left one. The liver is the largest gland in the body. It weighs more than one and a half kilogram and this is what? This is an anterior view of the liver where we can see two folds of peritoneal covering going from the area between the two lobes to the anterior abdominal wall. This is called the falciform uh, ligament of the liver. Then this falciform ligament as it goes up near the diaphragm, it splits into two. One goes to the right and one goes to the left. And these are parts of a ligament surrounding an area of superior and posterior surface of the liver called the coronary ligament and at the lowest end of the falciform ligament there is a cord-like ligament extending from the umbilicus uh, coming to the liver makes impression on the liver and ends in the superior vena cava. This was a vein called umbilical vein. It brings blood, oxygenated blood from the placenta to the inferior vena cava, but uh, during birth it changes from a vein into a ligament. A cross section of this ligament is rounded Therefore, it is called the round ligament of the liver or ligamentum teres. What is this view? This is an inferior view of the liver. The view we saw uh, the slide before was an anterior view. This is a posterior view of the liver. The right lobe has several areas. 
there is the major right lobe you see on your right and there is a division which is called the quadrate lobe this is between the gallbladder and the falciform ligament and it is called uh, quadrate lobe because it has four sides then there is another part of the right lobe which is to the left of inferior vena cava and it is called the caudate lobe because it is like a tail then we have the gallbladder gallbladder is a reservoir is a storage place of bile produced from the liver and the liver is covered with peritoneum is it hundred percent covered with peritoneum the answer is no there is an area which is not covered by the peritoneum and this is called the bare area of the liver it is surrounded by a ligament called coronary ligament from where the coronary ligament is coming it's coming from the two layers of the falciform ligament what is this impression we had talked about this when we talked about the stomach and the relation of the stomach to the liver uh, and we knew at the time that the liver is covering the fundus of the stomach so the fundus makes an impression on the inferior surface of the left lobe of the liver and we also uh, said that uh, the esophagus also makes an impression uh, on the liver and uh, on the right side to the side of the duodenum there is the kidney and the kidney uh, also makes an impression on the inferior surface of the liver What is this image showing me? It is showing me that this is the liver and inside the liver there are green passages. These are the ducts of the biliary system that are inside the liver. Therefore, they are called intrahepatic ductules. The story starts between two cells of the liver called hepatocytes and between these two cells there is a space that the liver cells are going to secrete bile into this very small uh, duct which is called canaliculus and canaliculi collect and they make ductules and then from each uh, liver uh, we have a duct called right hepatic duct and left hepatic uh, duct these are extra hepatic biliary passages <coughs> they come at the place called the hilum of the liver in which structures go in and out of the liver the structures that go in are the hepatic artery and the portal vein. The structure that comes out uh, are the biliary passages, the extra hepatic uh, ducts. And we have one coming from the right uh, lobe called right hepatic duct and one coming from the left lobe or left hepatic duct the two combine and they are called common hepatic duct this common hepatic duct as it comes down 
It's joined by uh, a duct coming from the gallbladder, which is called cystic duct. And so you come in hepatic duct plus the cystic duct, they produce what is called the common bile duct or the bile duct, uh, uh, as simple as that. Let's have a look at the biliary passages again. What are these biliary passages? They are intrahepatic passages. Where do they start? They start as canaliculi and then they unite and form ductules. And here is the other one called the left lobe. Then the right hepatic duct coming from the right lobe will join the left hepatic duct coming from the left lobe and they form the common hepatic duct. Then we have the gallbladder, the reservoir or the storage place of bile and the gallbladder has a duct called cystic duct. Now when the cystic duct joins the common hepatic duct, it is going to form the common bile duct. As it comes down posterior to the duodenum, it is joined by the pancreatic duct, the major pancreatic duct, and the two ducts join and open into the duodenum. The inferior surface of the liver is busy. It has impressions, it has uh, the hilum where the portal vein comes in and the hepatic artery and the biliary passages they come out and the right lobe separates from the left lobe uh, by a ligament, the falciform ligament, and we have the quadrate lobe on the side of the gallbladder and the caudate lobe on the side of the inferior vena cava. Uh, and these are answers for questions like uh, what is the hilum of the liver? What is the quadrate lobe? What is the caudate lobe? And what comes into the hilum of the liver? What comes out of the hilum of the liver? Now, this figure is not animated so that you practice your knowledge. Now, can you see the right lobe, the large one? And can you see the left lobe, right? Can you see the ligament between the right and left lobe, which is the falciform ligament, right? Now, look at the inferior surface of the liver. Can you see the place of things getting in and out? If yes, then you can name an artery, the vein, and the biliary passages. <coughs> Have you noticed the gallbladder and the duct that comes from the gallbladder? The cystic duct. Can you see which structure the cystic duct is joining? Uh, a green large duct coming down. If you look up into what is called the common bile duct, you can see that it is made of two branches, one coming from the right and one coming from the left. These are right and left uh, ducts and when they unite, they form the common hepatic.
lymphatic duct. Okay, now when you come down, you can see duodenum, and there is a structure called pancreas coming from the left, coming to the right, and then sitting in the C-shaped uh, duodenum, and that is the head of the pancreas, and you can see a faint yellow duct running in the pancreas, which is going to join the common bile duct, and they open uh, together into one opening into the second part of the duodenum, and notice the two drops of the secretions of both of these organs into the lumen of the duodenum. This is a self-explanatory figure of the gallbladder, which has a fundus body and the neck, and then the cystic duct is going to join the hepatic duct and form the common bile duct. Writing notes is a very important step you should do to tell yourself moment of reality. Can you write enough good information or you can't? It tells you reality of your knowledge. This is a mind map uh, about notes including keywords of essential facts. You can go through it. If we follow the center, which says the liver, and then if we go along the blue idea, saying that the liver has lobes, and there are a right lobe and a left lobe, and if you go down, you can see that the right lobe gives right hepatic duct, and the left lobe gives uh, the left hepatic duct. Look at the arrows. When they join, they form the common hepatic duct. Then, look at the solid green uh, structure, which is the gallbladder, and to its left, the information says that the gallbladder has a body fundus and it's made of smooth muscles and the lining epithelium is simple columnar and the gallbladder sends a cystic duct to join the common hepatic duct and form a common bile duct. And look at the circle uh, at the bottom of the common bile duct. You can see an arrow saying that the pancreatic duct is going to join. And uh, when it joins the common bile duct, it forms a, a dilatation called ampulla or batter. And this ampulla is going to open into the duodenum at a place called duodenal papilla. And so you can follow the branches of this mind map. This is an overview containing the essential basic knowledge of the liver arranged in its place. And it is a very good bird's eye view on the subject. This is a front view of the abdomen where you can see the liver, uh, the small intestine, the large intestine, but you can see a triangle uh, showing the pancreas, the C-shaped duodenum, and the gallbladder. Pancreas. Pancreas is a mixed gland. It is an endocrine and exocrine part. 
the endocrine part is made of around a million small masses of cells called islets of Langerhans. These islets, they are a collection of cells, of different types of cells, and surrounded by capillaries, and they secrete uh, insulin, and glucagon, and other uh, hormones, and these hormones are picked up by the blood capillaries and taken to the circulation. The exocrine part is made of acinide, producing enzymes and these SNI are connected to ducts and the duct is going to be connected to the common bile duct and open into the duodenum. The pancreas has a head, a body and a tail. There is a constriction between the head and the body of course it's called the neck. And this is the major pancreatic duct where it comes and joins the common bile duct which is coming from the liver and they both open into the major duodenal papilla. Please have a look at this figure and you can see different colors and uh, we are expanding our knowledge little bit by little bit uh, we know the tail the body the head and the neck and then now we add another part which is part of the head which is called the uncinate process here is another figure uh, of the pancreas where you can see the different parts that make pancreas. Writing notes. The title in the middle is the pancreas. Now let's follow the location. The black arrow going to the uh, upper right corner. Where is the pancreas? It's on the posterior abdominal wall, anterior to aorta and inferior vena cava. It is stuck to the posterior abdominal wall by the peritoneum and it's posterior to the stomach. Plus, it is anterior to the uh, left kidney, reaches the spleen, and it's right and is within the C-shaped structure of the duodenum. It has different parts, we have gone through that, and the structure it has a capsule, it is, has an exocrine part called the acinus part with its uh, ducts, and Let's have a look at the ducts. The ducts, they start inside the SNI. And this property is called intercalated ducts. And they are lined with columnar epithelium. We expect that ducts are usually lined with cuboidal epithelium. Here they are lined with columnar epithelium. These intercalated ducts, they join to form interlobular ducts and then <coughs> collect and uh, form the main pancreatic duct which is going to join the common bile duct. The question now is does the pancreas have only one duct coming out of it? The answer is not usually. Usually it 
has another duct called accessory pancreatic duct then let's see the endocrine part of pancreas which is formed by little clumps of uh, cells called islets of Langerhans and they are in the shape of a sphere and there are around one million of them and they have very fine capsule and they contain capillaries capillaries in endocrine uh, glands are usually fenestrated and the cells in this group of islets of Langerhan uh, are of different types uh, the ones uh, usually talked about is uh, the beta cell which is going to secrete insulin which is present in the center of the islets and the alpha cells which are fewer in number and they secrete glucagon and they are present at the periphery of the islets. This is a, an overview of the pancreas but it contains uh, lots of very basic key words and key information and it is present in front of our eyes in one screen or in one piece of paper so we know what are the, the branching information about the pancreas.